This is Dry Dock 6 at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, Bremerton, Washington. It is the largest dry dock in the world. Designed and constructed to accommodate the Navy's new supersized carriers, the dock is 1180 feet long, 180 feet wide, and 63 feet deep. It took three years to build. Within the dry dock complex are three electric substations, a 5,000 cubic feet per minute compressor plant, as well as steam, fresh and salt water, power, telephone, and sewage services. Crane tracks almost encircle it and connect with the shipyard tracks. A service building, floodlights, and a floating caisson gate closure complete the facility. Our story begins here in Seattle, Washington, two years before the actual start of construction. Design personnel of Moran, Proctor, Muser, and Rutledge of New York, and Carey and Kramer of Seattle, architect and engineer firms, meet with Navy officers to discuss plans and specs for the dry dock contract. In later consultations, the site is selected. Bidders visit the construction site and attend pre-bid conferences. In December 1958, the construction contract is awarded to the joint venture firm of Manson, Jones, Perini, Osberg for the amount of just over $21 million. And in January 1959, demolition and dredging, the first phase of the construction begins. Demolition and the moving of some buildings is needed to clear a work area adjacent to the construction site. Suction dredges and clamshell buckets are used to remove some 600,000 cubic yards of organic and unsuitable foundation material. The dredged material is transported one and a quarter miles from the construction site where it is deposited. This material is replaced with select fill from a borrow pit some three miles from the dry dock construction site. Barges haul it to the dredged area where it is sluiced over the side by high pressure hoses and allowed to free fall to the bottom. One and a third million cubic yards of fill and backfill is placed this way. Finished in March 1960, it marks the end of the first phase of construction. The second phase of the project requires construction of sheet pile cutoff walls to restrict the flow of water into the coffer dam. 3,000 tons of Z-section sheet steel is driven along both sides. The sheets, varying in length from 60 to 110 feet, are driven 10 feet into the subgrade. Another part of this second phase operation is the construction of a cellular entrance closure and the building up of the berm by filling. To allow the water pressure on both sides to equalize, openings are made in the sheet pilings by cutting and raising them. After all the pilings are in place and the cofferdam entrance closure is finished, the open pilings are hammered closed at low, low tide. Additional fill is then placed to build up the berm, completing the second phase of the project. The third phase, dewatering the site, and final excavating and slope trimming can now begin. For dewatering, 66 100-foot deep holes are punched and well casings inserted. Electric submersible deep well pumps are now installed throughout the coffer dam area. Ten thousand gallons of water are removed per minute to lower the water table 60 feet and maintain the water table within the berms at the same elevation of the free water. After dewatering, the very fine silting mud which has accumulated at the toe of the slopes is removed. This is done first with mud pumps. The remaining silted mud is mixed with coarse material and moved to a position where it can be taken out by drag line and bucket.
about one half of this material is removed by conveyor. The conveyor raises it over the side and deposits it next to the coffer dam. Later, it will be reused as backfill between the completed dock wall and the construction berm. Next, working roads are constructed and a 400 point well point system is installed to supplement water removal by the deep well submersible pumps and maintain a water table below the deepest excavation level. The headers and points which make up the well point system are placed just outside the dock structure location at the toe end of the berm slope. Used with the 66 submersible pumps, the water table is lowered and maintained throughout construction at two feet below the working level. 18 piezometers for observing water levels are located along the construction site perimeter. A cross section of the dock reveals it to be a relief type containing a drainage envelope of coarse grain gravel. Embedded in the gravel is drainage pipe connected into a drainage tunnel and then into a pump well. Without this, water seeping under the empty finished dry dock could lift it out of position. When the water level is lowered and under control, work begins on the other segment of phase three, filling and compacting, slope trimming, and final excavating. After trimming the berm and excavating to the desired depth, a 12 inch layer of dry material is spread and compacted. During compaction, it is found that a 73,000 square foot area near the dock's head end does not compact sufficiently. Various methods for strengthening the foundation soil are considered. The use of explosives is rejected because of possible damage to the coffer dam. The driving of piles is considered to be too expensive and impractical. It is decided to use a relatively new method called the vibroflotation process. This process employs mechanical vibration and simultaneous saturation with water in combination with the addition of gravel to move, float, and compact the soil into a dense state. The vibrating tool is forced into the ground under its own weight. When it reaches the desired depth, the bottom water jet is turned off and water is forced out and up through side jets. Additional material is then added to fill the void created by the jetting water and vibration. As the material is compacted, the vibrofloat is raised one foot at a time. From tests and measurements taken, it was determined that the vibroflotation method achieved the greatest compaction where it was needed most, in the deeper, finer grained fill material. When the first layer compaction of the entire coffer dam area is completed, a two foot, eight inch second layer of select gravel drainage course material is laid and compacted to 100% optimum moisture density with a vibratory compactor. Perforated clay tile pipe is then placed in trenches dug into the gravel drainage course. This removes all infiltering water and prevents the finished empty dock from floating out of position. This completes the third phase of the construction. The fourth and final phase, the actual dry dock construction, begins by laying a reinforced four inch thick concrete working mat to protect the drainage system from damage and provide a working surface. A steel reusable form will be used to make the first of 250 concrete floor blocks. Each block containing 250 cubic yards of concrete and 16 to 17 tons of reinforcing steel is seven feet thick. The first structural concrete is poured after almost 18 months of preparation. The floor blocks are arranged in a checkerboard pattern to allow for initial shrinkage of each block and to make as dense a floor as can be obtained using concrete with small monolithic pores. Next, the first steel reusable form is put up for the wall. The walls are constructed in two sections. The lower section is 24 feet high, and atop it is placed another section, 
24 feet high. The wall base is 12 feet thick, tapering up to 2.9 feet at the top. As the wall construction proceeds, work begins on building the pump well structure. This structure is built in a separate coffer dam enclosure because much of its depth is lower than the actual dry dock. It contains the vital organs of the dry dock, a quarter million gallon wet well, a substation, dock flooding and dewatering control consoles, drainage relief pumps and motors, and the main dewatering pumps and motors. Its four 115,000 gallons per minute pumps can dewater the dock of its 88 million gallons of water in four hours. Under construction simultaneously are flooding culverts, which are located along the dock walls. 18 flooding slots allow the water to flow in. At the outboard end of the dock, four 11 by 14 foot flooding inlets are provided. As the interior dry dock construction nears completion, work begins on the exterior finishing. 16 inch square columns are put in place. These columns are supports for the outboard end of the mechanical and electrical service tunnels. Wood connecting members are used temporarily to hold them in position until backfill is placed. With all the columns in place, drainage tile is laid around the dock's outside edges to keep the exterior water level low and the pressure at a minimum. Drain course material, as well as backfill, is placed between the dock wall and the berm. Some of this fill had been excavated earlier. The fill is built up a foot at a time and compacted under close control to ensure proper density. When the compacted material reaches the top of the dock walls, a working mat of steel and concrete is laid. On top of this mat, work begins on building a mechanical and electrical tunnel and a service tunnel. The service tunnel overhangs the edge of the dock so electrical, water, steam, and other service connections can be made easily with a dry dock ship. The mechanical tunnel completely encircles the dry dock. Wooden forms are placed for the pouring of concrete ladders from the top to the bottom dry dock interior. Lighting towers, capable of illuminating the entire working area, are erected around the perimeter of the dry dock structure. Tracks are laid to connect dry dock six with the trackage in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. These tracks will carry replenishment and repair supplies to the dock site and cranes for lifting and lowering the material. Asphalt is applied in the working area surrounding the dry dock and is carefully leveled to ensure proper drainage. With these operations complete, the dry dock is ready for flooding. The first flooding is done by positioning siphons over the side of the working mold. In order to remove the cellular coffer dam for placing of the floating caisson, the water level inside and outside the dock is equalized. The floating caisson, built in Portland, Oregon, is towed to the construction site. Built much like a ship with normal bulkheads and decks, the caisson is 173 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 63 feet deep. Its function is much like the stopper in the bathtub. However, the caisson keeps the water out. When the caisson is seated, the dry dock is dewatered so that final work can be done on power panels, switch gear, transformers, motors and pumps, and all dry dock controls. After 39 months of construction, the dry dock is ready for use. Flooding controls are open, and the dock begins to fill at the rate of almost 3 million gallons a minute, completely flooding the dry dock in 30 minutes. Normally, flooding wouldn't be done this rapidly and would take about 90 minutes. However, the controls are left wide open in this first controlled flooding. When the water level is equalized, the caisson is removed and the dry dock is ready to receive its first ship, the USS Kearsage CBS-33.
Dry Dock 6 stands as a tribute to the construction methods and the people associated with the job. Its completion has added a new naval facility that provides the type of repair and maintenance service needed for the big ships in today's Navy.